Thanks, everybody, <laughs> for coming out to see Alan and I. <laughs> we'll stop making that joke. It's not Had funny. anyone known that I would be here? <laughs> um, okay, so I feel like we have to uh, set the stage here. You do have there are there are three books now in a row on the subject of Thanksgiving. Yes. This is called in the publishing business a family read. A family read. What does that mean? <laughs> there is a picture. There is a picture book for young kids called Giving Thanks, and there is the adult book called We Gather Together, and this is the young readers' version. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Carolyn. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Do we have the other one. Yeah. Um, and then there is uh, then there's this young readers edition of that very same book that Carolyn so lovingly showed. And um, so that way you can have an entire family talk about the true history of Thanksgiving. Okay. Not the one we were told at school, most of us. And, um, and also about the history of gratitude, which is a big part of this book. Okay, so- These books. All right, so the story that she often tells, and I'll tell it now to sort of- uh, <laughs> See, this is why I don't up. like my husband. Yeah. So, um, yeah. No, no, no. About, I mean, one of, back, if you think back to like when we first moved here. No one knows when that was. 2006, <laughs> we first moved to town. Oh, yeah. um, and we're working on another project and she looks online and she finds this photo and she says to me, look, there were these women in Tennessee who worked <laughs> on the Manhattan Project, they didn't know that they were actually working on the making of the atomic bomb. Wouldn't that make an amazing story or amazing book? And what was my answer at the time? No, everybody knows that story. <laughs> I put that idea away. So, because my husband was so supportive. <clears throat> Okay, but so, but I mean, but but let's just think now. So like we're sitting at Thanksgiving dinner and you say to me, like, wouldn't it be a great idea to write a book about Thanksgiving? And, I'm and sure then I said, wait, don't tell me. My uh -huh. answer would have been like, just give me more stuffing. <laughs> <laughs> but no, how did you come up? When did you first come up with the idea or what, what were the ways into the story? The, um, I've always loved Thanksgiving. It's my favorite holiday. Um, it's it close, close, close to Halloween, but uh, I didn't realize how much I liked Thanksgiving until I was living overseas, mm -hmm. where they don't really do it. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, you know, and um, I was astounded the lengths to which me and my other expat friends were willing to go to get things like cranberries mm -hmm. and just anything tur mm -hmm. at turkeys that didn't have feathers. I mean, all this. All this what's sort of the stuff. hardest thing to find? What, what's, what's in Rome? Way? It was cranberries. In Paris, it was a, it was turkeys. And they have um, turkeys. They do, but they're not always plucked. I mean, that wasn't oh, a joke. Okay. And uh, <laughs> that, was, that was actually serious. Um, in Paris, I got what with friends, <coughs> what we thought was the smallest turkey ever. The oven door would not shut. <laughs> really takes a long time to cook a turkey when the oven door isn't shut. Did um, you temp the oven? Temp the oven. And then um, in Rome, where I lived for several years, uh, cranberries, you can't find cranberries anywhere. And I love cranberry sauce. It's one of my absolute favorite things. Um, and then somebody knew someone who worked for the food and agricultural organization. And we got into their commissary and we got cranberries but I was like why am I why am I doing this what's wrong with me <laughs> and then especially when I I mean I already knew it that you know not long after I you know got out of you know high school or college I knew that the whole yay happy story of pilgrims and Native Americans eating together was not entirely accurate um so it's like well why am I so attached to this story that you know this holiday that has a very complicated past, even right. if it has, I have a lot of fun at Thanksgiving. So, um, so I started look, I started looking into how it actually came to be. Mm -hmm. And then I got really interested. Why? Because we, for there's this, right, follow -up yeah, journals. nice follow-up, <laughs> why? Um, and, well, I mean, it depends, I mean, you can, there, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons. So I just actually found the whole idea of a holiday centered on gratitude to be really interesting. And mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is we are not by far not the first people that ever come up with that. 
So those kinds of celebrations rights um, have been around as long as humans have been around. Right. So you say you actually say something like Thanksgiving is not an American no, tradition. Oh my God. So why do close. you say that? Why? Well, the actual why? why. <laughs> <laughs> If you look at this piece of paper, it just says why. Like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, wait, what? You, no, you, said, you said Thanksgiving is not an American tradition. Oh my God, no, no. But then. The actual word Thanksgiving, which Thanksgiving. I, can, I can almost spell, and I had to pronounce when I did the audio book, and we had to do that one like 20 times. Um, the act, that actual word goes back to like the... 15th century there were thanksgivings in england and what was then called holland and um but what's the and it, spain you know they'd have thanksgivings for vanquishing thanksgiving celebrations for vanquishing you know enemies or so they know, would but they a would good harvest you know but they would declare yes. formally declare yes. a day of thanksgiving yes and that might be declared by whoever the municipal head was whoever the head of state was um a religious you know religious leader did, but wasn't it and also was a day of fasting and Thanksgiving? Not always, but often. So, so where did we get food? Where did we... <laughs> how did food come into this? Why? 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 <laughs> Why were there <laughs> food? Um, so jumping forward many, many years. No, the um, so basically a lot of these traditions started to sort of meld you have the um Harvest. days of thanksgiving and fasting which okay. was often you know you did that to basically say we're thankful for what we have we're going to have a day of penitence um and then there were days of thanksgiving that were followed by big meals with right. your friends okay right and so oh, I see. those sorts of things even though they would often have like more than one thanksgiving a year you might have a thanksgiving in spring a thanksgiving in fall um the day would change every year uh depending on you know different things could you have multiple in the united in, in the early colonies. united states in the colonies and then later early united states uh -huh. did we have thanksgivings that happened like would i celebrate thanksgiving in connecticut and then later in massachusetts you could if you wanted to I mean, because they were not on so the same. So in other same, words, every it wasn't, area, yeah, like every whoever, region yeah. just declared their own. Okay. Yes, and it depended. It might be, depending on mm. where the harvest was, it might be because something important happened in that community. But yes, Thanksgiving, there was usually one in the fall around the time right. of harvest, but those would change year to year depending on what the harvest would do, was doing. And it changed from colony to colony, territory to territory. Okay, so now at the, the very center of your book, your main protagonist is a woman, and I'm going to just describe what a she did. Woman. A when woman. When did I start writing? <laughs> when did I start writing about them? <laughs> um, so she is famous for the following thing. She introduced these concepts to the United States. I'm not telling the name yet. I have a system. Why? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. She she introduced the concept of the Christmas tree. To, to, the, um, to the United States. She thought that brides should wear white wedding dresses on their wedding day. She wrote the poem that later became the song, Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> and she introduced American women to a fascinating French word, lingerie. <laughs> uh -huh. um, this woman's name is Sarah Josepha Hale. Tell us about her. Besides wow. everything you just said. The, yes. um, no, she was, Sarah Josepha Hale was a, the, a widowed mother of five. She had no formal education because those were hard to get for young women in the early you know, 18th century. She got a very good hand-me-down education from her older brothers. Her parents were avid readers. Hey, books. And, um, <laughs> so she was extremely well read and she had the opportunity because a community was lacking a teacher. Back then, teaching was still pretty much reserved for, for men, um, but they had a need. So she started teaching school and she loved reading, she loved writing. And she had a husband who encouraged her to actually try and publish her writing. Right. And so she did. And um, sometimes under a lady, her, her byline would be a lady of Connecticut or a lady of New Hampshire or a lady wherever she was you know, writing from. Um, usually a lady of New Hampshire. And um, 
she just, as her career as a writer sort of took off, she lost her husband. Um, and again, five, five young kids. He went away. <laughs> to, to he, he's gone no longer with okay, us. so and so she had five children and she actually needed she needed money he did not um leave behind a lot of money and she started like a lot of us writers uh writing a lot so that she could pay the bills and she got attention and she was actually asked to edit a women's magazine okay I, and I, I know that it changes its name many times, many times we'll in the call course it of the book. Godie's Ladies Book. Okay, Godie's, G-O-D-E-Y apostrophe S, yes. Godie's Ladies Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, when she first joins it, it's in Boston, but then it gets bought, or no, no, I forget, am I telling the story wrong? You, you don't have to tell the whole story. Yeah. No, she, it, it, she was originally in Boston and then moved to Philadelphia, Philadelphia. where she spent the rest of her life. Yeah. Right, okay, and her, the publisher is a guy named Mr. Godie. Yep. And this magazine under her editorship becomes the, am I correct in saying that it is the most, it has the highest circulation in the, in, in, in the United States of, of any magazine, any, any, whether that's, it's aimed at men or women. That's what the publishers claim. Even yes. like a horse magazine did not get more. <laughs> not even, yes, not even Trotter's Weekly or whatever. Yeah, yeah, in fact, yeah. So, so, so just like, what did they have in this magazine? Just describe the magazine. It comes every month. Well, a lot of it was, a lot of it was advice. It's kind of, thing. just think of Martha Stewart living. Yeah. Um, I mean, she really honestly was like Martha Stewart before Martha Stewart and telling you how to entertain, what to cook, how to get stains out of your clothes. I mean, it's, honestly, it's Martha's got nothing on her and I'm a big Martha fan. So, um, it had that sort of stuff, but it always had an editor's letter, which she wrote. And she also published original writing, which was not that common back then. It was usual back then for people to actually clip stories either out of books or other magazines and repackage them in their own magazine, kind of like, uh, sort of like Reader's Digest, but different. Yeah. So actually hiring writers to write original pieces or publishing their, their original work was just beginning to take off. So the age of writers being able to actually support themselves kind of coincided with when she um, sort of came into her own as the editor of Godie's Ladies Book. So, and she would take the opportunity in the magazine in her editor's letter to sometimes opine about things that mattered to her. Okay, so this is the thing. There's, there's, there's two sides to her. One is she's publishing all these people who now we make young. Oh yeah, one of the yeah, first, so one of the first, uh, the one of the first. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, before he yeah. was Nathaniel Hawthorne, yeah. um, has a fascinating relationship with. We'll get to him in a second. Um, her mm -hmm. son's roommate. Right. We're not going to talk. About um, <laughs> and uh, why? Well, and um, Emerson. Oh yeah, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, Emerson uh, Washington. Longfellow, yeah. um, oh, Longfellow, Washington Irving, I, and it just goes on and on. Harry Beecher Stowe, I mean, on and on and on. And she was the person who supported these folks and published their work in her magazine really before anybody knew who they were. Um, okay, talk about the weirdest person ever to appear in her magazine. Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, who she also gave a start to. So okay, how did that story come edited, about? So tell that story. She's getting submissions for the magazine, and she gets something from uh, this young writer. She reviews his work in the magazine, and she says, you know, he's you know wanting in this way and a little you know boyish and this that and the other thing. But he shows signs of genius. You know, no less than you know, I forget who she named. She named some big muckety muck writer at the time. So. She gets a letter from her son, who's at West Point, who says, you know, mom, I, you know, my roommate, my classmate saw your review of his work and, you know, really appreciates that, you know, you, you gave him, you know, you, you published him, blah, 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 gave him attention. Um, I think it's great because, you know, he's not one for mathematics or science, you know, that's just not Edgar's thing. Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. So, 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 she, so, so Edgar, she basically she she gave Edgar Allan Poe his start. His start. And remained close with him his entire career. All because he had the misfortune to room at West Point with her son. <laughs> no, classmate. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So 
he writes a gossip column, which is this probably the, it doesn't seem like anything he would ever have written, but he writes a go gossip he column. He wrote it so he could make fun of other New York writers. Right. And, and it's the first time probably in America that a magazine had to come in and put in a disclaimer and say, Mr. Poe's opinions are not are not representative, you know, representative of, of, of yeah. the management. It's sort of like the DVD extra thing, you know. <laughs> These are not the views of the yeah. Okay. All right. So, but at the same time, she's also like adopting these pet causes. What are some of the ones that that she is? Oh, she helped raise money to finish the Bunker Hill Monument in uh, Boston. She raised money to build an entire uh, housing complex and library for. Uh, guys who had gone to see her, she had lost a brother at sea, who had gone to see and come back and were impoverished and their wives and children who, you know, had lost husbands and things that like that. So she raised all this money uh, to make sure these causes actually came to fruition. And no one, often when she would do this, she would call out in the magazine, you know, five cents, 10 cents, 25 cents. And she kind of got laughed off by a lot of folks. There were a lot of very big wealthy men in Boston who tried to raise money for the Bunker Hill Monument and couldn't do it. And her with her little 25 cents, dear readers, they raised like an affair where they made jam. Oh, yeah, they yeah. raised like $30,000. Yeah, they had like well, they were selling quilts 18, and pies 30, yeah. and jam in like Faneuil Hall. And they got it. And they got it done. Yeah. And they got it done. And they got okay. it done. But her biggest cause. Okay. Biggest cause is what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So talk about that. Why is she obsessed with Thanksgiving? She is. Uh, she loved the holiday just growing up. Okay. It changed every year. She would, you know, like everybody else, she'd wait to see when they were going to announce when Thanksgiving would be. And she loved the food. You know, mm -hmm. she wrote she wrote recipe books. She published oh, yeah, recipes right. in her magazines, all this sort of stuff. Uh, but she didn't understand why it couldn't be on the same day for everyone in the entire all the colonies because right. we weren't the United States. Right. Um, so well, no, we were. She was there for colonies to United States, so both. She didn't understand why it just couldn't be on the same day everywhere every year on the same day every year. Okay, so what's her what's her master plan? She's going to start writing who. She starts writing uh, governors, ambassadors in other countries, the heads of territories that weren't states yet, like California, places like that, um, saying, hey, we all have Thanksgiving. <clears throat> Why don't we all have it on the same day every year? It should be in November. It should be the last Thursday in November. Okay. And she tries to, she petitions people to try and get them on board. And, and they she start, knows, they, yeah. The, uh, people actually write her back and say, yeah. Yeah, you know, we'll do gonna, it. Well, we're going to do this in, in, in like the territory of Alaska. And she put so. in the magazine, you know, we got this many, you know, this many colonies this year, this many states this year, this many territories, this country, they celebrated it in Germany on the yeah. same day. But she knew that it would never be an established tradition or a law unless she got a president on board. So the president, I think she starts with Zachary Taylor. I don't, I don't remember the name. And it was five presidents that she writes one after another in a row. So that's- Who basically just ignored her. Five times four is like 20, 20 years each. Like well, every, I didn't think every, about it that way. Oh, yeah. so, for, so for a period of like 20 years or even uh, what, or, well, she was writing about Thanksgiving before she started writing presidents. She they, was doing this a long they time. They all blow her off except mm -hmm. one. Mr. Lincoln. Why? That's a good question. He keeps saying, this is, this is, I'm telling you this whole, look, it just says why right there. Um, so he, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, luck. Um, she basically, she made an appeal to um, Seward. Mm -hmm. you know, his secretary of state and to him. And it was the middle, it was the middle of the civil war. So arguably a time when people were not get, gathering together. Yeah. And she said, you know, wouldn't this be a wonderful time? What, you know, what would it say if we could all come together on this day, blah, blah, blah. And he just, he said, okay. He and said, he, okay. Bought, he bought into it. No, and he but... issues a proclamation, which is what leaders did anyway, saying this is going to be the day of Thanksgiving. Okay. But the country is, divided, right? That we, we have the, the the North is fighting the South. Um, he, I mean, I guess you could make the argument, he can't really make a proclamation for the entire country. But he did. But he did. And they actually- Whoever was agreeing that they were still right. in the country. So, so did the Confederacy also celebrate Thanksgiving? The It depended the, on different communities. Okay. Some communities did. Some communities, um, Jefferson Davis, um, one of the years, I don't know, I go through the- I go into detail for all the different years that this happened. Um, 
proclaimed his own Thanksgiving like a week before another year he proclaimed one a week after okay. um, and it was getting coverage all over the all over the world um, when they were doing this so I think one of the letters you have is like a letter from a soldier uh, from the conf confederate side who's saying oh you know we are, we're not fighting today because the Yankees are you know, celebrating Thanksgiving. So they basically just decided to like just, be respectful of yeah, Thanksgiving, which I thought was really interesting. So interesting. one of the best things I liked about doing this book and the adult book was going through all of these old newspaper reports and diaries of talking, like reading about how people actually celebrated Thanksgiving mm -hmm. during the war, in battle, um, including like the, the Massachusetts 54th, the first all black, um, you know, regiment in, in United States Army. Right. Um, you have all of these stories about with people with Clara Barton, you know, the famous nurse. Uh, all of these stories about how they actually managed to stop and do something to say thank you in the middle of all this horrible stuff that was going on. But there was still, of course, plenty of animosity. And there are also plenty of newspaper articles that were very fun to go into. Do you uh, remember where they're any of the actually making fun, fun of the fact that, you know, calling him King King Abraham and who is he to proclaim this, yeah. that, and the other thing and all that sort of stuff? I actually thought the stories of of Lincoln are, are interesting because it's a side of him that I had, you know, I don't know that much about Lincoln. I didn't read that many books about him, but there's Did there's, you read this one? Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> Why do you ask? Um, <laughs> no, but there, 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 there are two scenes that I think are kind of powerful. One is you have um, a description of Lincoln basically walking, riding his horse out of in and out of Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. every every night. His family is staying at a at basically a, a, his summer house, the soldiers' which is home, yeah. soldiers' home, which is outside D.C. And every day he he basically rides a horse up the street, which doesn't seem very safe, but okay. Um, a predictable route is not a great idea for right. someone who's being threatened. But the person who's, who's, the person who's, who's writing about this, I see the president every day, is Walt Whitman, mm -hmm. who was in DC to take care of, um, uh, he, was, he was a nurse famously yeah. during uh, the Civil War. Um, and the other thing is just the description of, of Lincoln's life outside the White House, basically, where is he? He's staying at this thing called the Soldier's, Soldier's Home, home mm -hmm. which is, is it he one stayed there in, is, He stayed there in the summer, and it was basically a place where injured soldiers could go and live and recuperate. Mm -hmm. But it was also the first, the first official, unofficial uh, national cemetery. This is before Arlington Cemetery existed. So this was also where everybody was getting buried. Right. So he literally, during the war, he would come out to get on his on his horse to go ride into, to you know, into the, the capital, and basically just walk by more graves every day, every single day, every single day. Just the bodies and the graves just kept literally piling up outside his door as he went into went into the city. So he actually commuted from this little three miles. Yes, three miles. Yeah, yes, yeah. three miles. Okay. Um, okay. So. But the, the point that you make in the book, and and I think that this expands uh, significantly towards the end, you you say that during during the letters that she was writing to all these presidents and even the, the, the information she got back uh, from Seward, no one ever mentions the pilgrims, right? The pilgrims are not- Oh no, my yeah. God, no. Oh okay. no, that's the, the my favorite thing about <laughs> this entire book is you have this woman basically making a national holiday that is her goal for life and um <coughs> she's writing about the need to come together and tradition and food and all this wonderful stuff right and then you have uh presidents getting on board so lincoln does it lincoln is assassinated um and then you know Johnson ends up doing it. Grant ends up doing so does she it. So have she has to, know... to keep. She has to keep petitioning everybody right. okay, because everybody. it's not a federal holiday. So right. it's still up to people to proclaim it. So then the only but reason. But in all, we all of these, all of these letters, yeah. all of these requests, all of these proclamations, nothing says anything about pilgrims. Nothing. Okay. Okay. Nothing says anything about pilgrims. Um, but she has to keep going till till she and she does this till she dies. Right. So when um, does she when 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 does she die? 
Do you remember the year? Don't make me remember. So I think eight years. I don't. I think know. it was either seventeen eighty or seventeen eighty one. Something like that. No, she no, was 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, <laughs> right. She lived to she lived to a ripe old age, and right. um, she died during Hayes Hayes's um, presidency. So, so the only reason we had Thanksgiving all those years was because she's like literally writing every year, saying, "Don't forget." Yeah, don't forget. Last Thursday of November, and. So then it just kind of became a habit right? and presidents just started doing it. It's like, oh, right. last Thursday of November, this is when we do this, this is when we do this. Right. Okay, so you tell this really cool story, which is that the, 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 the famous Encounter 1621 pilgrim story, the, the one that we all now think of as the first Thanksgiving. Which is why I did this for people are gonna, why'd you do three books on this? Yeah. It's like, we have to stop telling kids what you know we'd have to we wouldn't have all these stories every thanksgiving of this isn't true if we stop telling kids what wasn't true right. in the first place you don't have to debunk a myth if you don't put it out there in the first place but but like you tell the stories that like the, from the from the moment um um europeans set foot on this continent they started having you know days of thanksgiving to just celebrate we made it here and the boat didn't leak Right, but that yeah. could have been, that was the Spanish in the 1500s, right. that right. was the French did it in right. Florida before they got right. up here. So they're really... Because again, <clears throat> Thanksgiving existed in other right. parts of the world. Right. So Not to mention the Native Americans here, are also celebrating their form of They're celebrating their own um, rites of gratitude. Right. They, they, were, they were here a long time, yes. Right. So, um, but what I find is funny is like you tell us the story, like there was this, this very boring history historian um who finds a mention of this i don't think i would ever call another someone boring but <laughs> well this guy at least this not guy, publicly this guy i'm saying it loud and clear um, Why? no this guy in a book said he, he writes this book it's, it's like 1840s or so and he says i found mention of this encounter with these pilgrims met you know had had a meal with these uh, Native Americans, Indians, whatever they call them back then, they wouldn't have said Native Americans. But he <laughs> says, in, in the bottom of the footnote, at, at the very bottom of his page, he says, maybe this is the first Maybe this was the first Thanksgiving. And that's it. It's, a, it's one footnote ignoring the rest of the history of Thanksgiving. <laughs> but actually, the most compelling thing I found was yeah. in the um, late 18, like 1880s, early 1900s, a guy, J.H.A. Bone, was writing a story for a children's magazine called Our Young Folks. Oh, yeah. And he basically writes a romanticized, fanciful story of Thanksgiving that a lot of people took to be true. Mm -hmm. right. And then that got repeated. And then Good Housekeeping. <laughs> so between Sarah oh, Josepha yeah. Hale's magazine and Good Housekeeping, basically women's magazines have shaped the country forever. <laughs> so Good forward. Housekeeping actually publishes, um, talks about, there was a woman um, whose last name was Austin, not Jane. And she wrote um, a romance about the pilgrims coming to America in which there was a big joyful Thanksgiving, where they had like roasted turkey and pies and things, which weren't going to be cooked in right. 1621. Because they um, didn't have flour, they didn't have wheat. They, they were happy they shot some things. Okay, to okay, eat. right. Uh, <laughs> and the, the Native Americans they taught, didn't taught them how to store stuff because they didn't know but anything. The, so the, the famous paintings of like, yeah, you know, so like giant table. Good Housekeeping publishes this with this beautiful painting yeah. and all this sort of stuff. And so, and at this time, <laughs> We're starting to have a lot of immigration into America. There was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. So everybody was very much about, you know, were you from here? Were you born here? Okay. What, all that sort of stuff. So sort of the anti-immigrant sentiment kind of dovetailed with these fanciful stories coming out. And then myth begins to take hold. Okay, so, but. And everybody starts forgetting about Hale. Um, but the. The foods that we associate with Thanksgiving, turkey, mm -hmm. pumpkin pie, pasta. Um, <laughs> lasagna. You didn't have lasagna when you <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. No, but but all of those, all of those 
so-called food, all of those Thanksgiving foods, they all came from her. It's her suggestion, no, right? No, no, no. no that, that those were having, no, and I actually go into that mm -hmm. in, in the book as well. Having okay. fowl at a, at a grand feast, there was a queen in, one of the queens, I think she was one of the, I think Catherine de Medici or something had some big feast once and she demanded 60 turkeys. Okay. I mean, and this was before we had Thanksgiving. So, I mean, turkey, fowl, pheasant, right. um, if it had feathers and it couldn't run that fast, that was going to be on the table somehow. Um, cranberries had long been important um, in North America because they were high in vitamin C. The Native Americans figured this out. They were very high in vitamin C and they stored for a very long time. Cranberries. cranberries. Yeah. Um, same thing with... Um, uh, same thing with uh, gourds and pumpkins. They stored for a very long time. Okay. So a lot of the things that we associate with Thanksgiving actually were in this country for quite some time before okay. then. Um, okay, so what, let's jump ahead. Um, you know, if, if, she, if she or Lincoln came back today and you invited them to Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> And they, they would be like, wait, what's football? What, yeah, why, why, why are you all staring at the TV? You know, what, what, how did that start entering into? The more this became um, an established holiday, and again, was not a federal holiday until World War II. So okay. between she, her petitions and World War II, it could have gone out the window at any time. Um, Oh yeah. So when does it actually become a real official holiday? De December in uh, 1941. 1941. Yeah. Um, all right. So wait. Roosevelt is president. Yep. And why did why did they finally make it official? Somebody had finally put um, put it forth in Congress, like you know, put forth a resolution and. It was not somebody, Macy's. It, it was not they, Macy's and Gimbel. It was not Macy's and Gimbel. Macy's and Gimbel had already gotten um, on the parade uh, on the parade route, so to speak, but yeah. they. What was happening, because it wasn't set in stone, Roosevelt was petitioned uh, a couple different years by a merchant's organization to say, <laughs> could we please not have Thanksgiving the last Thursday of the month? Could it please be the one before that? Because you're cutting our selling season too short. Right. Okay. So even And so he starts, he considers it the first time, but then says no. Then they come back at him really hard um, in, in 1940. Uh, 39 or 40. And um, he agrees he's going to change Thanksgiving from the fourth, the last Thursday to the fourth Thursday that year. Okay. Well, the country starts flipping out because the calendars are already printed. Or something. Yeah, because yeah. at this point, even though it wasn't a federal holiday yet, the calendars already had Thanksgiving printed on it. Okay. All the big football games that they were, we're starting scheduled. to have were already scheduled for that last weekend okay. of November. Um, people had already, okay. they just started doing all this stuff. So they ended up, some states uh, said, we're, we're going to celebrate the first, the one we always do the last Thursday. Other states said, well, we'll do the one before. A couple states, including Missouri, Texas, and somewhere else, celebrated both. So they just took two Thursday, two weekends in a row off and just right. did it. Yeah. And that's when people said, okay, we've got a, what is this? So Congress actually steps be? in and actually passes. They actually off, passed a, yeah. Israel. Uh, but presidents today still have an annual proclamation yep. just because it's tradition. Yes. So you can actually read all of these have been um, the National Archives have made all the presidential proclamations uh, for Thanksgiving and a bunch of other proclamations available. Mm -hmm. So you can read them whenever you want. Look at them. They're very interesting to read. Are they? Yes, because <laughs> Why? presidents. Why? <laughs> <laughs> They're interesting to read because they actually, and this goes all the way back, they would, in the language, you know, we are thankful for blah, blah, blah. And they would often name things that they were responsible for. We're thankful that we have yada, 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 that, oh, I had a hand in, you know? And so they sort of, some presidents kind of took it as a way to um, More shopping days for Christmas. No, promote their promote their political platforms right. in a sense, um, <laughs> and some of them were in response to other people. I mean, the the Cherokee Nation issued Thanksgiving proclamations yes. often right after yeah. the, um, and I think some other nations did too. But the Cherokee Nation had very big Thanksgiving proclamations. Okay, we have a few more minutes, but I, I wanted to the very end of your book, you do something that you haven't done before. You talk about 
the, the science behind what you've been talking about. The science yeah, of I gratitude. I usually just ignore them. Yeah. <laughs> science yeah, there gratitude. was no science in the girls. Well, talks, whatever. So. I'm just, <laughs> you said you wanted to you read any of my books? Yes. <laughs> I, read, I read the one about this, the, the thing. <laughs> The place with the guy. He read that one. The, the science behind Alan. Why did you get give COVID? Me, give, me, give us like just a little bit on the science of gratitude. Why? Okay, is, so basically, is there actual science behind gratitude? There is, and um, no, seriously, I often talk about this as not just uh, it's not just the history of Thanksgiving. It's sort of the history of gratitude on a global level. Um, because Thanksgiving is just like the <laughs> of Thanksgiving. Um, and there has been a ton of research done, uh, especially in the 21st century, that the proven correlations between having a gratitude or a thankfulness practice lowers your blood pressure, um, increases, you know, it makes you people live longer, um, less likely to suffer from depression. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. And there's a huge body of research into this. So mm -hmm. the idea of actually coming together every once in a while, every day, ideally saying thank you for X, Y, or Z has actually been scientifically proven to help you mentally, physically, and emotionally. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that's I think that's very interesting. And actually, they've taken the research so far that they have done studies where having a gratitude practice when something is when things are really really bad. They studied uh, you know people who had gone through 9/11 and all that sort of stuff, and having some sort of they call it your um, your uh, your bounce back bounce back oh, ability. Yeah, bounce back um, ability. That having a gratitude practice when things are horrible mm -hmm. um is actually almost more powerful than you know saying thank you when things are are going pretty well i'm saying thank you now <laughs> for your attention and and, and we're gonna have <laughs> I mean, but um are we going to take questions now from the actual audience or from or from the online people? people or whoever let's do both let's okay. do both okay. yes hello hello thank you for coming thank you so much for doing this uh Sort of, I feel like George and Gracie. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like the greatest literary couple. <laughs> uh, so also great boots. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> cannot cannot uh, overlook that. But um, so so you have this idea about writing a book on Thanksgiving as a family read, but. How does it get from your idea to Philomel? Is that right? The imprint. That's the imprint of this, yeah. As like an author wannabe who has no idea how this all works, are you allowed to like reveal the secret of how this happened? Well, there's no <laughs> secret. It's Maybe not, it's secret. not, it's not as it's not as secretive as it sometimes uh -huh. I guess feels like it is. Yeah. But I mean to say how this happened, you've got to go way. Way. back Way. so to lincoln or... no to lincoln yeah <laughs> to lincoln and i no <laughs> the <laughs> the the book that was the toughest for me to sell was girls of atomic city because i was i i'd done a couple smaller books but not one of that magnitude before so i found an agent and finding an agent is its whole other thing yes it can it can easily be done but it takes a lot of it takes a lot of time and uh she found a home for that book that was simon and schuster with, for that book and the success of that book made it easier for me to sell the last castle and the success of both of those books <laughs> made it easy i mean i'm not you know i'm not saying i can walk in and say hey i want to do a book on blank you know mm -hmm. i still do proposals and explain what i want to do and all that sort of ah, stuff but having so that never goes away having oh, that yeah. having that um track record in nonfiction and history that features women so like if i walked in and said i'm, I'm doing a science fiction fantasy novel about 
um, you know, elves and Doberman pinchers that live together. <laughs> you know, they would look at me and go like, don't you have any other women in history you want to write about? I mean, so that's, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's part the, of it. That's part of it too. So I, I hardly have a, a free pass, but um, the other books leading up to these made it um, easier, but this I've never done one for three different age groups, but I thought it was very important for kids to actually know. And, and then a follow up, if I may. So, so there's three books, and can you say a little bit about how that works? Do you like write the adult one and then like simplify for younger readers? Do you write the younger yeah. one and then you know? No, I had actually intellectualize it for older readers. I mean, how, or do you just write three? In this, no, no. Books? In this case, I had actually contracted the adult book we gathered together and written it and then um i you know i was saying i would like to do it for younger readers so my agent then approached um philomel, philomel. and got the deals for the other two so the picture book was 32 pages so 32. it was much smaller and then this one is this one is really just trying to take um just simplify some of the sentences. And, you know, I, I do think kids have to learn from context and pick up dictionary every once in a while. But for the most part, just kind of simplifying some of the language. But it's essentially the, but it's not, the same not story. not having to completely write and write a completely new book. Though. Exactly. Right. The only thing that was completely different was the picture book. Picture. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Willie? As someone with the representative of the younger set here, <laughs> Hello. I was noticing that it's interesting that this has been you know, attention is not 100%. I want to, it, when you take the original book and think about it as a younger audience, do you do it just by feel, by instinct? Do you have like a committee of little <laughs> Committee of little people? Um, Were you not listening to the part about the elves? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, wait, so should we restate his question? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, so we were asked um, with a book like this, do you actually, how do you decide how to, I don't want to say, create, create it for a younger audience. reading audience? And I actually, um, years ago, worked for a children's magazine at Scholastic. So I actually have a fair amount of experience writing for 10, 11, 12 year olds. So that came in, that definitely came in handy. Um, Joe does as well. And Don't put me on. so I would, <laughs> I would run stuff by him. Yeah. And then, you know, my editor, that's all she does. So, yeah, she, all, that's um, all she, does. so it, it, she was al also a very good sounding board and she was very excited to do this because she had read the adult books. So. And she's also a a children's book author herself. Yeah, she's also a children's book author herself. So she's a writer editor. And um, yeah, so it's some of some of its feel, but some of it was definitely just having an experience writing for that age group. From the virtual audience. No virtual I never know where to look with these things. Right there. <laughs> um, she has been instructed to look at the camera. <laughs> so, you may have touched on this already, but how did you first learn of Sarah Josepha Hale? How did I first learn of Sarah Josepha Hale? I do not remember. See, this is what's driving and me this crazy. Is, this makes me nuts. So I, I really want to be able to answer this question. I don't remember. I've known um, who she was for actually, I, I knew who she was long before I decided to do this book. Um, I probably read about her somewhere. I don't know. I wish I wish I knew. Um, she, you know, I don't I don't know. There, she's one of those names that comes up every once in a while. It wasn't around Thanksgiving. Jeopardy. Jeopardy might have been Jeopardy, <laughs> Jeopardy question. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't. I, I honestly don't remember. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a kind of writing question. Okay. How did you come up doing your research? Like. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, what people, you know, just how people kind of generally live. And then I can go into like the specific thing that I want to do. But um, yeah, how do you do that? That's a great question. I actually think that, so the question was, how do you go about doing, hello, 
square thing. The, the question was, how do you go about doing research um, when it's on a topic that you don't necessarily know anything about taking place during a time period in which you didn't live, correct? Yeah. Okay. So I actually think not knowing very much about something is the best place to start when you're researching. It's also, I think, as a journalist, it's the best place to start if you're interviewing people, because what you don't want to do is go into whether you're interviewing someone or you're reading old papers or you're reading old books or letters, thinking you know everything, because then you'll miss stuff. Um, so coming at it just from a place of curiosity is, to me, I think the most important thing. So don't ever feel bothered if you don't think you know, you're there to learn stuff. And if you can actually kind of share your enthusiasm for learning about something with readers, that's when readers get really interested in what you're doing, I think. Um, so the bulk of my, for, for people who aren't alive anymore, which that's this book, um, if there are a lot living people to interview, I like interviewing living people. Otherwise, it's hard to interview the dead ones. You can't yeah. interview the dead ones, um, but they do leave, they leave letters and books and documents and to set, and for those, I mean, there are lots of different, um, I mean, you can find old books and documents on a, 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 something called Hathi Trust now. You can go to the National Archives. You can, all the different manuscripts and archives division, there's, um, there are archive grids that you can search and you can put in someone's name and they can tell you which universities have those papers. And so then, you know, because I have to travel a lot because um, contrary to what everybody thinks, everything is not scanned. Actually, most things are not scanned. So um, a lot of times it's, it's flying somewhere and sitting with very old pieces of paper, hoping you find something and you can understand their handwriting. Um, but for understanding what life was like, I think newspapers are amazing because you can see things like, you can look at two newspapers from two different parts of the country on the same day and look at how they decided to treat the same story. Like this newspaper wanted it on the front page. This newspaper didn't care about it. Um, you can look at advertisements and see what people were wearing. You can um, look at what people were selling. You can look at where um, some of them had, when photographs were around, you could see photos. Um, before that, there were illustrators who would illustrate things and give you a kind of a glimpse into the daily life. So those are some things. Letters are great. When you can find letters, they're fantastic because then you can kind of get in people's in people's heads. But yeah. Yeah, sure. Question from the virtual audience from Lynn. Hello, Lynn. Are you finding it difficult to get school districts in certain states? Is that your, is that you, Patricia? All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> to carry this book so that uh, it completely debunks the more acceptable narrative of the benevolent white man, or is it too soon to say? I actually don't. That's an excellent question. Um, I actually don't, that's not, getting this in school districts isn't my job. So there's a whole, there's a whole division at Penguin Random House that deals with stuff like that. Um, I do have a couple school visits coming up and they're in, they're, they're in states. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> they are in states and, um, I'm very excited about that. I have heard, I mean, I have anecdotal evidence from teacher friends in other states that uh, she's like, we still have the same old, it's right here in the, in the textbook. It's just the same old, same old. So, I mean, there's a part of me that, you know, wants to like, you know, find a list of, you know, all the different curriculums and who says what and why people still say the same thing. But um, I, I can't. I can't do that. I mean, I could, but I'm not, I'm not going to. Um, it just would take a lot of time, but I, I, I hope it gets in more. I'm excited to do the school visits because I would like to do more school visits and spread, spread the, the real word to the young people. Yes. Oh, we had a, you, yeah, you yeah. Your hand did you have your hand up? Yes. Okay. I was wondering, um, so at my school, we're doing an authors party. Are we doing an authors party? What is that? It's like 
you create a small piece and then share it with all parents and people at the parents. That's fantastic. Are those and snacks? <laughs> 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 Come on, Willie, get okay. on the snacks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. So, but um, they said that um, over fourth grade shouldn't write in the poems because everyone under fourth grade is pretty much just poetry. Interesting. It's it, it's um because it's kind of hard. To it's the uh, structure larger yeah. stories, mm -hmm. and it's easier for teachers to oh. just make rhymes. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. But you're not allowed to write poetry if you want to. Well, mm -hmm. we're allowed. It's just um, Jason probably shouldn't. <laughs> the should so word, my favorite. <laughs> right. Um, I and um, I was thinking I would do like. Um, historical fiction thing, yes. but like, <laughs> but what? Kind of like journal entries and stuff. Okay. But, um, I can't figure out like, um, I'm trying to do it like on the Oregon Trail, but I can't figure out like any way to get information on that when I am. <laughs> <laughs> Um, information on the Oregon Trail when you're 10 years old. Well, my favorite, I know this is going to sound like a lame answer, but this is where I go all the time. The library. Yeah, that's where I was thinking. Yeah, was thinking no, really, that. it's, I mean, it sounds lame, but it's really still like the best place to go. Yeah. And you know what's even better? The librarians who are in there, because they can, you walk in and they're like, Oregon Trail, right this way. I mean, that, that's, that's their jam. They love doing that. Yeah. Which is typically the library. Go to Delta. Um, it has stuff on like US history. It usually has that one. Well, I like that though. I I, I think that's I think that's great. And you know what? If you want to do a poem too, I think you should. <laughs> so we're at the almost at the top of the hour. Yes. Um, yeah. If you have any more questions for Denise and Joe, Denise will be signing afterwards, and you can ask those questions. Let's do a little wrap up. Okay. And uh, final, final hilarious thoughts and profound ideas. Wait, I have profound <laughs> thoughts. I'll leave that to Why? <laughs> Why? 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 <laughs> What is your favorite tip for cooking stuffing or gravy? Oh. Or do you have a favorite right. Thanksgiving? Okay. Do you have okay. a favorite Thanksgiving recipe you want to just throw out? There? Oh, yes. I always do the same cranberry sauce every year. I do a Zinfandel cranberry sauce with orange rinds. And yeah. it's the best thing in the world. But okay, stuffing. I am a big believer in making stuffing muffins. So you get really giant stuffings tins stuffing. and you put stuffing. the stuffing in there you bake them they're crispy on the outside and Ooh. soft on the inside Ooh. and crispy stuffing is my favorite part and then everybody gets their own muffin or more than one if they want and you can just pour the gravy right on top of it but the best part is leftovers because then the next day you slice the leftover muffins like this, and then they become the bread for your turkey sandwich. Whoa. Oh I will leave you with that. And that is the way to do All it. Right. That is the way to do yes. turkey. Thank you. Yes.